Good morning, and welcome to another edition of Daily Scripture with Pastor Dave. I am David Morgan, your host and pastor at Bear Swamp Baptist Church. And it's Monday morning. It's a beautiful day. I think it's uh, going to be a great week. And uh, a lot of that just depends on us, doesn't it? Uh, just resolve in your heart that you're going to have a great week this week. And uh, I'm sure that you will. Uh, we are reading through the Bible in this little program. And the way we're doing it, I've been talking about this, I've been emphasizing this lately, is that if you're going to read through the Bible, you have to have a plan. And the plan that I've chosen to use is the five-day Bible reading program. And what it does is it takes you through the Bible in one year by reading five days a week, whatever days you choose. The reason I like that is because if you happen to miss a day, you have two days to make that up. Let's say you decide to read Monday to Friday like I'm doing. Well, that means if you miss on Wednesday, then you can read Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And even if you miss two days, you can make up uh, two days. You have those two buffer days. Uh, and that's what sets it apart from the seven-day-a-week reading programs where if you get a day or two behind, you you just it's so hard to catch up. So thank you for joining me. Um, we're going to get right into it here, uh, but let's pray first. And we'll begin. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, giving us this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so today the reading is coming from Ezekiel chapters 1 through 3 and John chapter 1. So we're going to be in, of course, we, we sprinkle in the Psalms every now and then, but we're going to be in these two books for quite a while. The book of Ezekiel has, let me, let me check, 48 chapters, I think. Yeah, there's 48 chapters, so we're going to be here at least uh, three weeks, would be my guess. And the book of John has 21 chapters, I think. 20 or 21. So that's a good, you know, four weeks of our readings. So we're going to be barreling right in uh, towards the finish line here. We have less than three months to go, about two and a half months. So let's talk about who Ezekiel was real quick. Ezekiel was a prophet, obviously. He was a priest. Not all prophets were priests, and obviously not all priests were prophets. What does that mean? Well, that means that he came from the line of Levi, um, the high priest during the, or actually, he came from the line of Levi, yes. Not necessarily from Aaron. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if he did or not. But he was in the priestly line. However, he was not able to serve as a priest because he was one of the captives carried away to Babylon. Um, in our readings, we've been going through Jeremiah, and before that Isaiah, and we've been building towards this exile. And now we're here. The people of Judah have been carried away by Nebuchadnezzar and his forces. And now the question is, presented to the faithful Jew is, what now? The promises of God seem to be obliterated. Everything that I've ever believed, not me personally, but can you put yourself in their shoes for just a minute? Everything that I've ever believed about what God said, about what my parents told me, about what my community communicated to me, seems to be false. We're not even in the promised land anymore. It was promised to us, and we're not there. We're God's people, but we're falling under God's punishment. This doesn't make sense. And so God continues to faithfully send his prophets to remind the people of why they're going through what they're going through. And you help me out here. Why were they going through it? Well, the short answer, of course, is idolatry. And so one of the things, one of the emphases that we're going to see over and over again in the exilic prophets, that is the prophets who prophesied while they were in exile, you have your pre-exilic prophets, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is even exilic a little bit. Then you have your exilic prophets like Ezekiel, uh, Daniel. Daniel was during the exile. And then you have your post 
exilic prophets, which is most of the minor prophets. But um, some of the some of the minor prophets were pre-exilic, like Jonah. Jonah prophesied to the northern kingdom before Assyria came. So it's helpful to understand a little bit about the background of these of these guys before we, we begin reading. Um, but speaking of reading, let's go ahead and jump into it here. Ezekiel chapter 1. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open up. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard uh, Bible 1995 update. By the way, it's glad to, I'm glad to have Miss Melody watching. How are you feeling? I need to come over and see you. I've already had uh, the virus, so my understanding is I'm immune. <laughs> we should hang out. All right, let's... Uh, Let's read together Ezekiel chapters 1 through 3. Now, you need to hold on to your hats because Ezekiel has some strange visions. Now, it came about in the 30th year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was by the river Kibar among the exiles, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. 30th year of what? That is one question that you always have to ask yourself when you... because. The, they don't. They didn't operate with a calendar like we do, where it was you know year number such and such. Like if I gave you today's date, I think it's the nineteenth of October, two thousand twenty. And it doesn't matter where in the world you go. If you say you know they're going to give you today's date, October the nineteenth, nineteen. I'm sorry, two thousand twenty. Well, but but different. That's not. It wasn't uniform back then. Um, Babylon would have their own calendar. Uh, I mean, it was all a 12-month calendar, but they would measure things differently. They would measure things from the beginning of a certain dynasty. Egyptians, the same thing. So, the 30th year of what? Well, most people believe that he's talking about his own life. Um, he's now 30 years old. Uh, which is interesting because priests would go into their priestly ministry when they turned 30. So, among, by the river Kibar, among the exiles. So where is Kibar? It's in a province of Babylon. The heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's exile. So, this is a little more, you know, Oh, okay. King Jehoiachin has been in exile for five years, so which is probably the fifth year of Ezekiel's exile as well. The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar, and there the hand of the Lord came upon him. As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it and in its midst something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it, there were figures resembling four living beings. And this was their appearance. They had human form. Keep in mind, this is a vision. Is it a vision of something that literally exists? Or is it a vision of something that symbolizes something that literally exists. I don't know the answer. I do know that we need to be careful when pressing something that is clearly labeled a vision and uh, and, and talk about its literal features because we just don't know. This was their appearance. They had human form. So I'm guessing, you know, two arms, two legs, a torso, head, hair. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Yikes. <laughs> their legs were straight and their feet were like a calf's hoof and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings and their four sides were human hands. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. This would have been a terrifying sight. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right, and the face of a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle, I guess, in the back. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching another being, and two covering their bodies. 
Now, I will say what's interesting is that Isaiah has a similar type prophecy with the seraphim where they have six wings. So it's very possible. Hey, could God create a being like this? He sure could. Whatever it is, they're angels. So they're not human. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go without turning as they went. I don't, I'm not sure how the physics of this makes sense, but I'm, let's just go with it. In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright and lightning was flashing from the fire. And the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Remember, they went where the Spirit was about to go. The Spirit would be the Spirit of God. Now as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings for each of the four of them. So that would be four wheels, right? The appearance of the wheels, well, how many beings were there? Let's go back and look. Four living beings, yeah. So there's four wheels. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling barrel. And all four of them had the same form, their appearance and the workmanship being as if one wheel were within another, so concentric circles. Whenever they moved, they moved in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. <laughs> I'm telling you, visions. Think about some of the crazy dreams you've had. Um, now, of course, this one's inspired by God, but still, they don't always make literal or physical sense. As for their rims, they were lofty and awesome, and the rims of all four of them were full of eyes round about. Freaky. Whenever the living beings moved, I'm sorry, did I miss something? Yeah, the wheels moved with them. And whenever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction, and the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Whenever those went, these went, and whenever those stood still, those stood still, and whenever those rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. So, so far what we've seen is a vision of these four living beings and the wheels and a little bit about how they move. So that's a summary. Let's see where it goes. What is, what is God trying to tell us? Now over the heads of the living beings there was something like an expanse, like the awesome gleam of crystal spread out over their heads. Under the expanse their wings were stretched straight out, one toward the other. Each one also had two wings covering its body on the one side and on the other. I also heard the sound of their wings like the sound of abundant waters as they went, like the voice of the Almighty, a sound of tumult like the sound of an army camp. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. So there's something of God's voice or something that sounds like God's voice coming from these beings. That's important because now we're getting some, an understanding of where they get their authority, you know, where they come from. They come from God. There came a voice from above the expanse that was over their heads. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. I'm sorry, I read that already. Verse 26. Now above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne. Uh-oh. Like lapis lazuli in appearance. And on that, which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. This is getting extraordinarily similar to Isaiah's vision. Isaiah chapter 6, he says, I, I beheld and I looked a throne high and lifted up, and upon the throne was a figure. And so Ezekiel's vision is very similar to Isaiah's. Then I noticed from the appearance of his loins and something and upward, something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around within it, and from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire, and there was a radiance around him. As the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance, 
Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So, he's seeing a vision of what God's glory looks like. What it literally looks like? Or some, or does this just communicate what his glory is like? It's hard to tell. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. Chapter 2. Then he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. By the way, this is a, this is a designation we're going to see over and over and over again in the book of Ezekiel. Son of man. Which is interesting because Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. As he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet. Now this is interesting. Where had the Spirit been before? It had been these beings and in the wheels. And I heard him speaking to me. Then he said to me, Son of Man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, to a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. I am sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord Yahweh. Remember, all lowercase caps means Yahweh. As for them, whether they listen or not, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, neither fear them nor fear their words, though thistles and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions. Neither fear their words, nor be dismayed at their presence, for they are a rebellious house. But you shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or not, for they are rebellious. This is the preacher's call. Whether the people listen or not, and I've been in churches where people didn't listen. I've been in churches where they did listen. Uh, that's not the preacher's main concern. The preacher's main concern is to preach the word. Verse 8, Now you, son of man, listen to what I am speaking to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I am giving you. Then I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll was in it. When he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and back, and written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. Chapter 3, then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. Clearly, we're still in vision form. You don't eat scrolls. So I opened my mouth and he fed me this scroll. He said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not being sent to a people of unintelligible speech or difficult language, but to the house of Israel, nor to many peoples of unintelligible speech or different language, whose words you cannot understand. But I have sent you to them who should listen to you. Yet the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, since they are not willing to listen to me. Surely the whole house of Israel is stubborn and obstinate. Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, or be dismayed before them, though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, take into your heart all my words which I will speak to you, and listen closely. Go to the exiles, to the sons of your people, and speak to them and tell them, whether they listen or not, thus says the Lord God. Then the Spirit lifted me up, still in the vision, and I heard a great rumbling sound behind me. Blessed be the glory of the Lord in his place. So this was, it didn't sound like my voice, it was loud and rumbling and thunderous. And I heard the sound of the wings of the living beings touching one another, and the sound of the wheels beside them. Even a great rumbling sound. Remember, earlier it said that when their wings touched one another, it sounded like many waters, like the voice of the Almighty. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went embittered in the rage of my spirit, and the hand of the Lord was strong on me. Then I came to the exiles who lived beside the river Kibar at Tel Abib, 
and I sat there seven days where they were living, causing consternation among them. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, and I think it's implied there that he was fasting for those seven days. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, and I think it also is implied that he neither ate nor spoke anything. Now, you need to drink water during the seven days, so they probably brought him water. At the end of the seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you have warned the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. By the way, this fits in very well with the theme of evangelism that I have been talking about um, on Sunday mornings at the church. And I probably should bring a message from verses 18 through 21 because this is very important for us to understand. God will hold us accountable if we don't tell people about Christ. Verse 20, and again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I place an obstacle before him, he will die. Since you have not warned him, he shall die in his sin. And his righteous deeds which he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. However, if you have warned the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning, and you have delivered yourself. The hand of the Lord was on me there, and he said to me, Get up, go out to the plain, and there I will speak to you. So I got up and went out to the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord was standing there, like the glory by which I saw by the river Kibar, and I fell on my face. The Spirit then entered me and made me stand on my feet, and he spoke with me and said to me, Go, shut yourself up in your house. As for you, son of man, they will put ropes on you and bind you with them so that you cannot go out among them. Moreover, I will make your, your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth, so that you will be mute, and cannot be a man who rebukes them, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak to you, I will open your mouth, and you will say to them, Thus says the Lord God, He who hears, let him hear. Jesus says that a lot later. This is where he gets it. And he who refuses, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. And, and you know this is uh, this is this is the preacher's job today, and it's not just the preacher's job; it's your job. Uh, there, God is putting the onus on you to warn people, and if you do not, God will require their blood at your hand. Sobering words, guys. Sobering words. John chapter one, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. In the beginning was the Word. Uh, I, I use, just real quick, when I was growing up, I had to memorize John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14 on several different occasions. Um, I went to a Christian school. I know they're not going to do that at your public schools or even secular private schools. But anyway, I had to memorize this passage several times growing up. I still remember it because of the times that I had to memorize it. I would encourage you to memorize John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. There's so much practical doctrine here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What a stunning declaration of the deity of Christ. In the beginning, so the question is, who is the Word? Well, the Word was with God. So it's someone that's distinct from God. And here we need to be bring some clarity. Distinct from God the Father. And the Word was God. Whoever this person is, is also identified with God. Not just in some ancillary form, 
like I am identified with Barry Swamp Baptist Church, but I'm not the church. Jesus is God. It's amazing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, Jesus did not begin to exist when he was conceived by Mary. He already existed. He is the pre-existent second person of the Trinity. He is God, just as much as the Father, just as much as the Spirit. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. In other words, Jesus is the creator of Genesis chapter 1. Interesting. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. Now this is not John the one that wrote this book. This is not John the Apostle. Let's continue. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, the Jewish people, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. There's the gospel right there. Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is called regeneration. And this is what makes a person saved. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for He existed before me. He's talking about John the Baptist here. For of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. The only begotten here is Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son. So let's read about the testimony of John the Baptist. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. By the way, uh, you all know who Elijah is, of course. Who is the prophet? They ask, uh, they ask John the Baptist this, Are you the prophet? So who is this prophet? Well, let me explain this to you if I can find the, the right uh, the right uh, reference. So if you go back to Gen Deuteronomy chapter 18, I just want to do this real quick. This is, well, we're not going to do a lot of Bible study today. I want to respect your time. But in Deuteronomy chapter 18, it says this, this is Moses speaking before he dies. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command them. And so the Jews were looking for not just the Messiah. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. When they read Deuteronomy chapter 18, they did not equate that prophet with the coming Messiah. Obviously, uh, that is who Jesus was. He was both the prophet and the Messiah. But the Jews in their mind... They thought of them as being different people, which as a 
premillennialists, I think, is really interesting. During the time of the tribulation, uh, we're going to obviously find, have the false Christ, the Antichrist, will rise up. But there also will be the false, what? Prophet. And I think, this is me personally, can't prove it. I think that the Jews are going to equate the false prophet with the prophet from Deuteronomy chapter 18. And they're going to equate the false Christ with obviously the Messiah. So he says, uh, verse 21, are you the prophet? He answered, no. And they said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. This, of course, comes from Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, which we read um, probably a month or two ago. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. John's editorial comment. They asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing, if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize in water. But among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on who... On, this is he on behalf of whom I said yesterday, because it says the next day. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. Now this is pretty cool. Um, even though John's gospel doesn't tell us this, we know from the Gospel of Luke, that John the Baptist and Jesus are first cousins. Or maybe they're second cousins. They're second cousins. But they're cousins. I mean, what is the chance that they don't know each other? It's zero. Family was everything back then. I mean, I don't know all my cousins, but we don't live in that kind of society anymore. So when he says, I did not recognize him here, John's not saying, oh, I didn't know who he was. He's saying, I didn't know he was the Messiah. He was just cousin Jesus, which I think is pretty cool. Verse 32, John testified saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. I can just sort of imagine. That's a quote from John the Baptist talking to John the Apostle. I sort of imagine John the Apostle and John the Baptist sitting and drinking tea or coffee, whatever it was they were drinking, over, over a fire. And John the Baptist telling John, this is... This is, this is what I saw. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? What are you looking for? <laughs> they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you'll see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And so, it's interesting, John hasn't even told us who Simon Peter is. He's just sort of introducing people. But why would he say Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, when he hasn't even introduced Simon Peter yet? And I think it, it's understood that pe the people who are reading John's gospel already have an understanding of who Simon Peter is, probably because they've already read Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Verse 41, He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, 
we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. Now, what does that tell you? Verse 41 tells you that John was writing not to Jews. Because if John were writing to Jews, he would not have translated Messiah. <laughs> um, we have found the Messiah. We have found the Mashiach, which translated means Christ, anointed one. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. There again, translating Hebraic terms, which he would not have do, done if he was writing to Hebrews. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee. By the way, that makes sense. If you think about the book of Revelation, uh, who did John write to? Chapters 1 through 3, or chapters 1 and 2. Uh, the seven churches are all in what we would call modern day, basically Turkey and Greece. They were Greek. Uh, they were mainly Greek speaking. Not many Jews in those churches. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, in the city of Andrew and Peter. So they were buddies. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You'll see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Wow, John's Gospel is going to be awesome. Uh, John wants his... Remember, the very first verse and the verses that follow right after that are kind of like the propositional statement um, of the gospel writer. And in John's gospel, and, and everything that follows that is what he's trying to prove in the rest of his book. And so as we read the book of John, we need to keep in mind that what he's trying to do is prove that Jesus is the word the Word that was with God, the Word that was God, that was in the beginning with God, the Word that was made flesh. So keep that in mind as we read together. I enjoyed this time with you. Um, let me just make a quick look and see if anybody else came on. Nope, just Melody today, I think. Melody, thanks for joining me. If anybody else watches this at a later date, please drop a comment. Let me know that you joined me. And I will see you again tomorrow. May God bless you.